Hi, good morning. Um, my throat is not treating me very well today, so um, if you don't understand any, something I'm saying, just raise your hand, please. Um, my name is Pedro. Um, you can find me on GitHub and Twitter under that handle. I work for YLD, uh, and I'm a partner there, and I'm a chief futurist there. Uh, also, I'm an OJS developer, and I'm an offline-first enthusiast. Um, if you were using OJS back in the very early days, you may know me from the Notepad screencast show or the Note Patterns book series. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about how to build um, a reliable checkout mechanism. Um, that's something that I've been working for on and off for a few years. And it's using Node.js, PodgeDB, and replicated transaction documents. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking about e-commerce and the much dreaded checkout experience. Um, the checkout is a journey that begins with the optimistic checkout button, uh, but only really begins uh, once you submit, once the user uh, submits the confirmation button. Once the user does that, behind the scenes, there's a bunch of ancient machinery that starts cranking uh, and eventually ends in a success message or and a confirmation email. But um, what can go wrong um, between those steps? Um, let's look at some uh, failure modes. First one is the duplicate transaction, and I've been victim of this several times. Uh, it's reflected on the don't press me more than once button pattern. Also, there's the undefined transaction state, um, which is represented by the infinite spinner, the spinner that never ends uh, spinning. And one extreme of this is client uh, crashes. I mean, not only crashes, but also disconnections from the network or the application or browser just quitting or your device running out of battery and shutting down. Uh, and this is while the transaction is being processed. Um, but I want to talk a bit about, more about mobile and mobile applications in the context of uh, e-commerce transactions. So this slide uh, has some stats about mobile, uh, uh, first world mobile network. Um, and here you can see that if you have a 4G uh, device or connection, you can expect to be effectively offline 1.3% of the time. If you, have, you are bouncing between 3 and 4G, you can expect to be effectively offline an average of 4.1%, um, which is surprisingly high to me. Um, and if you have a very uh, modern device that's 4G, uh, the network may kick you to 3G, because all, or your device may kick you to a lower bandwidth protocol because um, to save the battery, for instance. So effectively, you'll be somewhere around this value and this value. And this is for UK, I mean, Vodafone UK. Uh, so this is for a first world um, modern mobile network. You can only imagine on developing countries uh, how these numbers pan out. Um, especially, not only because of the, the, the quality of the, of the mobile networks, backbone connection, uh, connectivity, or even average device quality. Um, so this last slide was taken from um, Il, Il, uh, a Google engineer named Ilya Grigoric. He did a, a very good Google I.O. talk. Yeah, I recommend you to check it out if you want to learn more about developing for uh, mobile um, mobile networks, developing applications that use mobile networks. Um, so the main takeaway is that uh, developing reliable mobile apps is particularly difficult, and being offline is uh, no, it's not an exception, it's a given. Um, developers, developers should be uh, aware of that. Um, so let's do an exercise. Let's grade how applications deal with networking failures. 
So worst grades is that an application that does no error handling. So everything, it says that everything goes well when it doesn't. Um, after that is uh, an application that notifies the user when an error occurs, but doesn't give the user a chance to recover from that. C is an application that notifies the user and gives the user a chance to recover from that error. Um, perhaps this is perhaps uh, uh, you, the user can perhaps refresh the browser, and the application state, transaction state uh, resumes, for instance. Or you can hit a refresh button or retry button and not be afraid of duplications. Um, B is an application that can uh, uh, recover from some uh, system errors, automatically recover from that. And A is an app that can do that and recover from user errors. And by user errors, I mean like closing the tab, closing the application, uh, device shutting down. The application is able to um, able to uh, regain the, the, the transaction state and proceed from there on. So this last uh, stage is particularly expensive to develop an application for, uh, typically. Um, and why is that? Um, so let's look at some systems architecture for a typical uh, application, e-commerce application that is doing a, a, a transaction. Um, so we start off with some back-end systems and third-party integrations that you need to touch to perform the transaction. So one of these may be a, service, a payment provider or uh, a, a train uh, provider, another train provider, and some internal uh, accounting system, etc. On top of that, you layer uh, an HTTP API, which can be a generic HTTP API or a uh, just only um, um, application-specific HTTP API. And that's you're going to use to perform the e-commerce transaction over. Um, but what, what happens uh, when this doesn't happen? When, what happens when there is a gateway, gateway uh, error or a timeout or an internal server error? How does the app know how to handle that, those types of errors? Should it retry? Should it, uh, should it pull the state? Uh, if it does recover, how, does it, how well does it recover? How well tested are the recovery mechanisms that this app is going to implement? Um, so this is just too much responsibility for the app developer. Um, this and the works on my laptop mentality usually leads to very poor results. Um, Wait, there, there must be a better way. Um, actually, all we want to do is to sync the transaction state. After the user starts the transaction, you just have to sync the transaction state between the back end and the front end, and vice versa. So in theory, if we place a sync layer on the client and a sync layer on a server that talks to the API, and uh, some type of sync protocol that is resilient to networking failures, uh, we will be able to accomplish this. Um, the question is first is uh, which sync protocol to use? Uh, as Jan Lenhardt uh, said on Twitter, um, friends don't let friends build their own sync protocol. So with that in mind, uh, we're going to use CouchDB or some of the descendant products uh, CouchDB is a database that was built from the ground thinking about syncability, thinking about replication. And these uh, descendant pro uh, products or services uh, talk the same replication protocol. So we can use them to talk to each other or to talk to um, CouchDB it's, uh, Couch itself. So in this architecture, we're going to have our application is going to have a local CouchDB database um, which is going to sync with the remote either PouchDB or CouchDB database. And listening on changes on this database, there is a clerk process that's implemented in Node.js that's going to talk to the API on behalf of the client. Okay, the client doesn't talk directly to the transactional API, the clerk does. 
So if you have multiple uh, client applications, that's how the architecture looks like. So you have the UI that syncs with the local uh, database, that syncs through the internet with a remote counterpart, and then you have a clerk process that listens to changes and performs changes on this database. And the clerk is the only one that talks to the backend services again. And you have a clerk per customer. So there are a few uh, patterns, a few assumptions on, on, on this architecture. Uh, so you have like one database per customer. Uh, to people that use relational databases or MongoDB, this may sound a bit awkward, but it's a very common pattern in CouchDB. That's a way to make a CouchDB and related uh, databases scale, and also to secure access rights. So one user only accesses uh, their database, is not able to access other users' database. And also, something I haven't told you yet, is one document per transaction. So the transaction is going to be represented by one document in the database, and this uh, document is a JSON document that contains all the data that is necessary to, to perform the transaction. So for instance, if you're booking a plane trip, uh, you have all the, 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 the flights, and you have all the, the, the people, quantities, uh, and you have the, the fares, and perhaps a payment token or a, some payment data, and some billing uh, data, uh, for instance, and that's all that this document will eventually contain all the data that is necessary to perform this transaction. And this document is going to be sync between the client and, and the server. So the sync protocol replicates the transaction bidirectionally, as I told you. And since this protocol is, re is uh, uh, resilient to a network uh, faults, uh, we automatically give our application tolerance to being offline. Especially in the context of mobile apps, this is very important uh, because, as you can see, between four and one percent on modern mobile networks, uh, you are expected to be offline. And if you're caught offline while performing a transaction, this pattern takes care of it. On the back end, you have uh, a clerk process that reacts to uh, trans tr uh, transaction state changes. So each transaction has one state. And you can define like a state machine uh, for each one of the transactions. This is a very simplified state machine for a taxi application like Uber, uh, but you can model like a finite state machine with uh, discrete uh, states and transitions between them. And some of these transitions are performed by the customer, and some of these transitions are performed by the backend um, or in lockst in lockstep. So here we can have a long-running transaction uh, that spans not only for a few seconds, but spans throughout uh, many minutes. Um, and this is a pattern also that, that this architecture supports. So the clerk not only listens to changes, but also injects transaction changes when backend event, events occur. So for instance, if you, get a, you listen on a message queue on the backend, and your, tra your taxi ride has been canceled, uh, the clerk can change the state of the transaction and say the transaction is canceled or the, the taxi trip is canceled. So let's see some, uh, some code. First on the user interface. Here I'm going to use um, React and Redux and a package called Pouch Redux Middleware. This package is responsible for syncing the state between a Redux state and a PouchDB uh, database. Uh, but directionally. So it's not, it's not very clear, but here you can see a, a reducer. Um, the first three are performing actions on uh, the, tr the transaction collection. Uh, and the last one is uh, adding, uh, sorry, changing some properties on the transaction document. And that's it. That's, that's all you have to worry uh, in, in the UI. Uh, w in what regards the, the back end. So let's watch some front end, uh, some back end code. So first, uh, I'm going to use Poch Clerk. Poch Clerk is something that implements the clerk pattern that I showed you uh, on top of a CouchDB or a PouchDB uh, database. Uh, clerk has two responsibilities. So it's to handle state transitions and to do 
async updates on the transaction documents. So state transitions, uh, a state transition is a function that gets called once uh, the transaction enters a certain state. For instance, in this, we're entering the arrived destination uh, state, and uh, because of that, this function gets called with the transaction document and the callback. And so the backend, here we're calling the backend, a random function on the backend that, uh, complete the, uh, that handles the, um, uh, this state entry. And when it's done, we change the document we, uh, and transition to the next uh, state, which is, in this case, service completed. Uh, as, I, as I told you, the clerk can also can handle async updater, updates. So an async updater is uh, an object, uh, kind of a class, that uh, has at least a start and a stop uh, method. And the start, uh, you can uh, use the start, for instance, to uh, bind to a messaging uh, service. You can subscribe, in this case, we're subscribing to a cancel event for uh, the, the, the current transaction. And once we get the cancel event, we handle it by uh, changing the document, transitioning it to a new state, and saving the document. Uh, once uh, the, 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 the async updater, sorry, once the transaction ends, this stop uh, function is called, and uh, we can take this opportunity to cancel the subscription that we had back here, um, so that we're no longer listening to cancel events. Okay, so uh, let's do a quick demo of this. So this is um, a taxi-like application that I built for demonstrating this, um, this architecture. And it's, uh, here I'm starting the, I'm sorry, this is very small, starting the, the static server. And the application is called Drag and Drop. It's uh, Uber for dragons. Uh, so I'm going to request a dragon. I'm going to ask to be picked up from this point. Destination is that point. Uh, I choose a payment method. I confirm. There's a bunch of dragons around me. Uh, eventually, one of them gets assigned. Uh, yes, I have a drive. You can see my front end skills are awesome here. <laughs> and then uh, the driver is, is en route, picking me up and eventually I'm going to go to the destination. <clears throat> Once I arrive there, he drops me. I rate my dragon, and I'm done. Okay, now I'm going to show you the transaction document, which is being updated real time here. So these are changes that I'm performing on the state of the transaction document, and eventually I get changes performed by the server also. So you can see that the state change, searching driver, is the, the current state. And now is driver en route. And you can see that the driver uh, location is being changed here. <clears throat> and now something, driver has arrived. I'm getting picked up, and now you can see that my, the passenger lat long is being updated, and it's the same as the uh, driver position. And now I am updating the, the the rating, and you can see the rating is reflected here in the document also. Now I'm going to show you how this is resilient to networking failures. Okay, I'm going, this is a sync server. I'm going to stop the sync server, which gets me an error message here, uh, but I still can start a transaction. I'm starting a transaction, but the, the transaction is not progressing, so I'm, I'm restarting the sync server uh, to simulate a, a network, uh, network is back, and now the transaction is able to resume. 
Now I'm able to select a, a payment method. And I, again, before confirming, I'm going to uh, disconnect. Now I'm going to reconnect, and the transaction state is resumed. <clears throat> Yeah, so um, I have, I think I have another, yeah, another disconnection here. The transactional state is, is frozen, uh, resume connectivity, and it resumes uh, the state. Okay. Proceeding. Okay. Oh, yeah, the demo is open source if you want to check it out on pgt slash pouch clerk example app on GitHub. Uh, also, my, uh, these slides will be available after the talk. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you.